Hello. Comrades. Today we're going to be asking the question, will we be working under socialism? And the answer is yes, but only if we want to, which of course we will, but the nature of this work is going to be fundamentally different. Now the reason we're talking about this today then is because this nature is so commonly misunderstood by newer leftists and then even older ones such as Marxist-Leninists. Now, whenever we try to explain something under socialism, we first need to contrast to how it works under capitalism. Under capitalism, a tiny minority of people own the majority of society's tools, machinery, and property. This is how capitalism has been since its inception and how it must remain in order to continue existing. As such, for the majority of people in society, it's required that in order to attain basic necessities such as food and rent, you need to first become employed by someone with the means to create useful products. Being employed by somebody means you're given permission to work on their property with their tools in exchange for a wage. You privately conduct this labour under predefined conditions such as the length of the workday and the rate of pay. During this process, you become alienated from your labour, which means you dedicate a portion of your time and effort into creating something which you yourself do not personally have a stake in, but is rather owned by your employer and then sold for a profit. And as such, this means that the thing you're creating isn't even made directly for the sake of usefulness, but rather again for profit. And this is particularly relevant to our topic today, because it's this concept of wage labour that forms the underlying basis for this division between work and leisure. Now by contrast under socialism, the means of production are owned communally by the workers themselves, rather than privately by any capitalist. And so the only way to organise things is democratically. And furthermore, the alienation of labour disappears too, and with it, the strict divisions of labour begin to fade. Nobody is coerced into working, either by threat of starvation or by some kind of state entity. And furthermore, because workers are no longer alienated from their own labour, the strict divisions of labour fade away too. Looking back at capitalism, when you determined a working day, it meant the following things. For this length of time, you were required to work on somebody else's property in exchange for a wage. The very nature of a set working day implies the existence of a wage, because it's essentially the parameters for the exchange of labour power for money. And furthermore, it implies the existence of an authority over that property, as there needs to be some way to enforce that you continually work on this property and are also only on this property for this set allocated time. Without either the concept of money or the designated owner of property, the concept of a working day makes no sense, and all you're left with is the organic organisation of workers only responsible to themselves. As such, the way that people begin to view work changes as well. If people are no longer stuck in specific and specialised jobs, but rather have the opportunities to branch out into, di into different careers at will, then they no longer start to see jobs as separate from their own personal lives. Marx actually describes the concept quite well in this quote from uh, the German ideology. In a communist society, when nobody has one exclusive sphere of activity, but each can become accomplished in any branch he wishes, society regulates the general production and thus makes it possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow. To hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticise after dinner, just as I have a mind without ever becoming a hunter fisherman, herdsman, or critic. This process, however, is gradual. What I'm referring to here is the lower phase of communism, often referred to as socialism, but during, say, the establishment of the dictatorship of the proletariat, before class is truly abolished, it might be fair to suggest that there might require some mandatory work. As an example, while this is admittedly a very oversimplistic explanation, what we mostly saw in Anarchist Catalonia was a failure of wider organisation by the working class to produce enough to fight against the fascist counter-revolutionaries, leading to them being crushed, and obviously this isn't preferable. However, this phase isn't socialism at all yet. It's incapable of attaining socialism due to its own need to defend itself but is rather the beginnings of a revolution towards socialism. During the revolution itself, while under threat from all sides, I do think some notion of mandatory work will probably be necessary. 
but this is just some random person's opinion in the internet and the actual topic of how to carry out revolution is wildly debated in the left so if you're interested in this specifically i would recommend seeking out other people's opinions because it does go beyond the scope of this video ultimately i think these kinds of things do rest mainly on the organic and spontaneous organization of the revolutionaries themselves if we've already explained lower phase communism and delved into the dictatorship of the proletariat a bit what about work under higher phase communism? Well, for that, we have another Marx quote. In a higher phase communist society, after the enslaving subordination of the individual to the division of labor, and there within also the antithesis between mental and physical labor has vanished. After labor has become not only a means of life, but life's prime wants. After the productive forces are also increased with all around development of the individual and all springs of cooperative wealth flow more abundantly, only then, then can the narrow horizon of bourgeois of rights be crossed in its entirety and society inscribe in its banners from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. Most importantly here is the line, after labor has become not a means of life, but life's prime wants. What's meant here is that under higher phase communism, the very distinction between work and leisure disappears completely. We've been conditioned all our lives to think of work as time stolen from us, something that we have to get through so we can continue doing what we actually want to do, even from the beginning of our school lives up until now. This is because of our alienation, because we're forced by necessity to work for other people's benefits and profits. But in a society where labor is directly social and the means of production are owned communally, it becomes more about meeting the community's wants and needs. And with it, people's very mentalities around works changes. The work you carry out no longer feels separate, but rather a fundamental piece of your life that you actually enjoy, more akin to a hobby than a job. Of course, this doesn't mean that every moment of your life and whatever work you do, it will be pure bliss, but you will be working for yourself and your community. Uh, you'll be owning directly the product of your own labor and you'll no longer be alienated. So of course, none of this occurs immediately under lower phase communism. This is all higher phase communism. And the, the very existence of labor vouchers, say, in lower phase communism would suggest this. Even if themselves they're not currency or wages, as they don't mediate the exchange between commodities that hold value, they're still something you receive in exchange for working, and therefore would probably go towards maintaining a barrier between work and leisure time. However, even with these barriers carrying on to lower phase communism, these birthmarks of capitalism, to suggest that any kind of mandatory work would exist with set working times and, and places just completely goes against the concept of what socialism actually is. The only way that such things could ever exist in any image of socialism is if there was some kind of state to exist to own and mediate this property, but then property wouldn't be communally owned, it would be state owned. And even if the representatives of the state were chosen as democratically as possible, these representatives would still hold more power over the means of production than any individual worker. The only reason to ever assert that such a system is socialist is because you've preemptively decided that the USSR and similar societies are socialism. And therefore, to maintain this worldview, you have to advocate its various features as socialism, such as mandatory work, commodity production, and state ownership. But as we've seen, none of these ideas are found in Marx. And so, if there are any newer leftists watching this video, the one thing I'd ask you to take away is that the idea of a working day under socialism, if it's nothing more than a liberal holdover for the revolutionaries that struggle to imagine a society radically different to their own. But anyway, watching the video, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed my new camera as well, which I have no idea what I'm doing with. And hopefully, over the next few weeks or whatever, next few months, we should get new videos onto this channel. But nonetheless, I am still here. I am still trying to make content, so don't worry about that. But anyways, thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you some other time.